Ah, hello my friends, welcome back to my channel. Yep, we're tackling some more flat earthers today. Oh no, Professor Stick, I don't like it when you go for low-hanging flat earthers. Cover some other topics, please. Well, you can shut up because YouTube won't let me make any other types of content. Now, this video more so attempts to address science in general and scientific figures rather than the Earth's shape. So I think it'll be of a bit of a change of pace. So, why would we not blindly accept whatever we are told by these proclaimed experts and giants in the field of science? Why would we not simply accept whatever these so-called science experts proclaim as truth? You know, you don't have to listen to popular science figures. Heck, you don't have to listen to anyone in particular if you don't want to. But scientific consensus is a different thing. If you say, oh, I don't want to listen to Lawrence Krauss, that's different than saying, oh, I don't want to listen to the 7 million scientists that have agreed on a particular fact. I mean, some of the world's greatest men of science end up on this stage with thousands in attendance to hear these experts proclaim that it is not only totally acceptable to believe that everything we know of in the physical world came from absolutely nothing. Wow, who knew that flat earthers are also creationists? Yeah, I'm a little tired trying to state this all the time whenever someone thinks that science claims that everything came from nothing. It's just simply not the case. Nothing in this sense doesn't mean absolutely nothing, but more so it refers to whatever there was before matter existed. Virtual particles, negative energy, whatever it may be. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean you can go ahead and straw man the claim. And this nothing exploded in our distant past and totally ignored the second law of thermodynamics which they themselves proclaim as truth. No, it doesn't oppose the second law of thermodynamics. We use the word explosion to describe the Big Bang, but that's actually not what happened. Rather, it was an expansion of space. Explosion makes it sound like it began in a chaotic fashion. It didn't. What resulted from the Big Bang was actually a very, very low state of entropy. And over time, this entropy increased. So no law was violated here. You can think of it in terms of gravity. Since everything immediately following the Big Bang was evenly spread out, gravity had relatively the same force in different areas. That's low entropy. But as billions of years passed, matter and particles began and clumping, which aggregated the gravitational pull to particular areas of the universe. When gravity is clumped and less evenly spread out, that's a state of higher entropy. So this whole time entropy has been constantly increasing since the beginning of the universe, and that is consistent with the second law of thermodynamics. But this nothing that exploded not only ignored their own scientific law of entropy, but that the resulting explosion of nothing resulted in an orderly and neatly designed universe complete with intelligent life forms. Well, I wouldn't say it's complete with intelligent life forms. I mean, just look at yourself. Whether it be truth, error, or some mixture of the two, the masses will believe these people simply because they see them as authority figures in the field of science. Again, it's not just one person stating these facts. There are millions of scientists in the world that all agree that the Big Bang happened, that evolution is true, and that the Earth is round. These are not things that are debated amongst scientists or even regular people. I don't even think this is really debated outside of the United States. Only you guys are trying to cast doubt upon these facts. So let me see, who do I believe? Millions of scientists who have dedicated their lives to bettering our understanding of the universe, or a couple of high school dropouts. You see, there are alternative reasons why science might tell you a lie. Yeah, good luck to any scientist trying to lie about something when their claims and research results are literally peer-reviewed by a bunch of other scientists, even scientists from different countries. That's what really makes the results of science just that much more accurate. If it is required that other scientists proofread and reproduce your work, then you can't just claim whatever you want or lie about whatever you want. That's not to say that every scientific claim is true, but something like the Big Bang where evolution certainly has no doubt behind them. Could be they're helping the pharmaceutical bodies that they're with. Think about it. In the United States, we have the Food and Drug Administration. What a combo. Food and drug. If you don't get the right foods in you, you're going to be on drugs. Uh, well, no. If you get sick in general, and depending on your sickness, you might be on drugs to treat whatever illness you have. Is that a problem? No, most certainly not, as long as you are taking the right drugs at the right dosage, prescribed by your doctor, of course. You seem to be generalizing a lot. If you don't eat right, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll be on drugs. The best treatment for obesity, after all, is exercise and diet. Neither of those activities require you to shove pills down your throat. So I'm not sure what you're talking about. I just know that you're trying to demonize drugs. Also, what's this random jab at the FDA? They make sure that things are up to standard. What they do is very important to ensure the validity of our treatment. Ah, here we go, the famous food pyramid that the top scientists who were recruited by the government to get together and give us something simple, some sort of easy chart that everybody can follow so that we can end this diabetes and obesity epidemic. What do they tell us? Eat the most of the bottom. Grains and cereals. Absolute garbage. 
The food pyramid was a simplification based on an estimation of how much each category should be eaten per day by any individual. Of course, because of how general and non-specific this food pyramid is, it is bad at reflecting all situations. For example, people who have specific health conditions like lactose intolerance or the fact that it doesn't differentiate between different foods within the same category. It also demonizes fats, which shouldn't necessarily be the case. But you know, for something that came out almost five decades ago, the information obviously wouldn't be as accurate as the information we have today. There are indeed instances that science is wrong, or it doesn't tell the full truth. Does that mean that we dismiss science as a whole? Of course not. Because although some doubt can be cast on some claims made by scientists, topics like the Big Bang Theory or the shape of the Earth is not disputable. Not to mention that the food pyramid tried hard to correct itself. There are variations created that improved the accuracy of information later on. Scientists are always taking steps to improve and update knowledge. We know that the food pyramid isn't 100% accurate because of science. So isn't it kind of, you know, wrong to use this as an argument against science? You would think the anecdotal evidence would get people to wake up and start thinking about these things after about 20 years of the obesity epidemic getting worse. First of all, anecdotal evidence is the weakest form of evidence there is, so much so that it shouldn't even be called evidence. Something isn't true just because someone else claimed that this is the case for them. Instead, what is required is rigorous scientific experimentation. Which would I rather believe? Multiple papers getting hundreds or thousands of samples that all prove the same thing, or some random guy down the street who said he experienced something? Second of all, this is America, right? Obesity is a huge problem in general here due to the types of food available to consume, especially the rise of fast food. It doesn't seem to me, at least, that Americans care too much about what types of food they eat. I doubt they're referring to the food pyramid when deciding their next meal. Your statement would only hold water if people actually followed the pyramid and are getting obese off it. But as it turns out, eating these types of foods gives you brain fog and keeps you from thinking clearly. <laughs> really? Please tell me then, what types of food prevents you from thinking clearly? I'm gonna need the exact food and the exact molecule within the food that does that. Not bad with the fruits and vegetables, but you have to watch what kinds. Because if you have the bad mixture of fructose in there, you're going to end up with insulin spikes. Insulin spikes, which comes from grains in particular, especially the simple grains and white breads, they cause insulin to spike. When your insulin spikes, your body stores anything fat into the system. It needs to process the sugar. So it keeps the fat stored to deal with later. So you store fat and you get heavier. First of all, insulin is released in response to high blood sugar. It in itself isn't a problem, but rather the amount of sugar you consume that makes the difference. Second of all, although fructose is not good for you, it doesn't trigger insulin production. Insulin is produced by beta cells and more so increases the absorption of glucose into your cells and liver. Fructose is not glucose, and the beta cells are less sensitive to it. Of course, I'm not defending fructose in any way, since excess consumption can lead to insulin resistance, higher LDL levels, and liver damage. It can indeed make you obese, but the reasoning is entirely different. And then at the top, you have fat, oil, salts, and sweets. Well, <laughs> this is a, a mixture of good and bad. See, a lot of sweets are actually down here in the grains and cereals because they're all mixed in. Uh, you have good fats and bad fats, like avocados are great fats. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with this pyramid, right? Just looking at it doesn't give specifics, nor does it give differentiation to different types of food in the same category. Which is why more detail was added on later, which gave exactly how much was recommended to eat per day. The food pyramid by itself doesn't look very impressive, but that's not all there is to it. Not only have more information been added on if you look deeper, but better visuals were created as well. And this was due to science. Moving on. Ah, uh, here we have what science handed us on a silver platter. Actually, they handed this to the pharmaceutical companies on a silver platter. Body Mass Index, or BMI. There's only one problem with the BMI, and it's a big one. It takes into zero consideration how much muscle you actually have in your body and the differences people have in bone mass. BMI was never intended to be used as accurate medical information. Its purpose is to give you a ballpark on where you stand. Of course, it is much less accurate for people with large amounts of muscle, pregnant women, children, and elderly people. If you're an athlete, or if your bone density is not normal, then the BMI will not be a good tool for you. But for everyone else, it can be a good estimation. Pardon my French, I'm not good at pronouncing French, but I believe his name is pronounced Le Verrier. This is how everybody looked at the solar system until recently. Pay attention to this picture because we're going to come back to this. But what is missing from this picture that this famous astronomer of the late 1800s came up with? Well, something is missing. It's the planet Vulcan. Okay, right in here is Vulcan, or should have been. In fact, the mathematics of the orbits didn't make sense, so there just had to be another planet there between Mercury and the Sun. <sighs> okay, 
Verrier proposed the idea of a planet there because Mercury's orbit was baffling. It didn't follow traditional paths of orbit, so he thought something was there to interfere, which he called Vulcan. But this model was never truly accepted by the scientific community. Rather, people looked for it and came up with nothing, so the idea was rejected entirely. This is how science works. When there's a phenomenon that you want to explain, you first come up with hypotheses attempting to explain it. Then you test the hypotheses and gather evidence to see if they are valid. Vulcan was a hypothesis that did not get the backup it needed, so it was dismissed by the scientific community. You should be focused on our current explanation nation on Mercury's abnormal orbit, aka the Sun's influence on space-time around Mercury's orbit path, rather than a rejected hypothesis formed centuries ago. Also, I'm quite curious on your mentality of even bringing this point up. I know you're a flat earther because of the types of content you usually make on your channel, so what is this? People offering challenging explanations to something fake as a competition to what NASA will tell to the public or something? Explain to me how this story of mathematically predicting Vulcan's existence fits within your view of the flat earth. Alright, that's it for today. The original video is quite long, so I'll revisit it again as a part 2 later on. Thanks for watching everyone. Shout out to Fireshard and Mark Orsini for being my lord and saviors over at Patreon. Your support means everything to me. I'll see you guys next week.